Welcome, fellow brave believers. This is Kingdom Cast. I'm Sean Griffin. Thanks for joining me tonight. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a unique topic. This is one that it's it's amazing that this information is allowed to actually be on the internet. We're going to be looking at a Hebrew University professor actually lay out a full on presentation. I don't have we're not going to do the entire hour and a half, but she lays out a full on presentation. We're going to listen to parts of it that are important. Explaining why rabbinical Judaism has brainwashed and indoctrinated fellow Jewish people for the last 2000 years to try as best they can to not believe in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. And after you hear from her own words, because this is something that she explains in the presentation that she is a scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as other things, even though her official title is someone that is a um, her official title is someone that is, she's a professor of uh, Jewish mysticism and philosophy, but yet she studies other areas uh, of the scriptures. And as you're going to hear tonight, she's been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls for quite some time. And she's kind of perplexed by what she's reading in re in regards or in relation to what she has been taught through rabbinic Judaism most of her life, because there's a huge discrepancy in the mindset of the Hebrew community 2000 years ago compared to the rabbinic teachings that have been around since the first century. And she actually goes into explaining the difference in that theology. That's what we're going to listen to tonight. It's going to be fascinating, guys. If you if you haven't subscribed, subscribe to Kingdom Cast. If you, or if you're watching this in Kingdom of Context, subscribe to Kingdom of Context. Hit the like button. Uh, if this blesses you, be sure to share it as always. And um, and I just want to give a big shout out and a thank you to everyone that uh, continues to support us and what we do. Um, if it blesses you, the links in the description below for how you can support us and everyone that has to PayPal and to Patreon. And um, we just we want to say a huge thank you. My wife and I are extremely grateful. You help us continue to do what we do and to continue to come on and do these podcasts and do all these shows. Um, so we just want to give you a big thank you. And if you haven't, some people like to actually uh, do like a one-time gift through PayPal, but other people just want to do like a, a, a another monthly, like they sit up on a monthly auto draft through Patreon if that's easier for you or whatever. But links are in the description below. We're trying to build our Patreon to get up to 300 supporters. That way we can actually start working on our Book of Enoch documentary and our, which which would require me to actually go to Ethiopia. So this is one of our ministry goals that we're doing. So guys, uh, if, it, if God puts it on your heart, thank you for considering that. We have a lively chat already. Uh, I just want to say hello to a few people before we get started. Um, Carla Marlberg is here. How Welcome. Howard Sanford. Welcome, sir. Stephen Belk. AC. Stephen Schofield. The Great Deception are back. Welcome, brothers. Janet. Steffi M. Let me see. Mr. Bear is back. Bill Craddock. Stephen Belk, The Line Within Us. Welcome, brother. I want to give a big shout out to all of our admins and moderators. Really appreciate you uh, keeping the chat peaceful and loving, uh, getting rid of all the spam and all the contention. We just want people to be able to focus and have, you know, learn something. That's the whole reason I do all these shows. Elias Stewart's back. Welcome, brother. Scott McVicker. Welcome, brother. Stephen, Stephen Belk is back. Paul Levy. Master Soup. Sean M. Bill Craddock, Creation Bear. It's a great name. Maxim Lavrov's back. Earl Rogers, Sim Coder. Marie W. D. Love. Welcome, everybody. Really appreciate you being here. West Blaze Jones is back. West Blaze Music, I should say. If you guys haven't gone subscribe to West Blaze Music's channel, go, go do that as well. Let's get some great music over there. Just want to thank you guys for joining me tonight. All right. Let's jump right into it, okay? I'm gonna share my screen. I got the audio going as far as I can tell. <gasps> Make sure I got all the audio happening properly. All right, this is Professor Rachel Elior. She is Israeli professor of Jewish philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Jerusalem. Her principal subject of research has been the history of early Jewish mysticism and Ms. Elior is the John and Golda Cohen Professor of Jewish Philosophy and Jewish Mystical Thought at the Hebrew University, where she has taught since 1978. Currently, she's the head of the Department of the Jewish Thought, and she earned her PhD, Summa Cum Laude, 1976. Her specialties are early Jewish mysticism, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Hakala literature, Messianism, 
Sabbateanism, Hasidism, Kabad, Frankism, and the role of women in Jewish culture. So, guys, the reason why I'm, I'm kind of highlighting to show you who we're talking about, this lady is respected by the people that she's actually presenting information in this lecture that rubs against everything they teach. I don't know what become of this lady after this presentation as far as, you know, if she received some sort of academic backlash because of this. But all I know is that she's presenting from her perspective. And this is why I'm presenting it. I could tell all this information she's telling you guys, I've already told you on this channel for two and a half years, except I'm doing it through scripture. She's going to tell you from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which many of you guys know, there's lots of scripture that was buried with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And she's going to talk about those books. And she's going to talk about what's in those books and why she's kind of confused. She doesn't quite understand why the the major themes of the things in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls that she's reading about have been ignored, dismissed, and literally censored, according to her own words, by rabbinic Judaism for 2,000 years. But we're going to explain why through Scripture. So, guys, I hope you really enjoy tonight. Um, let's get right into it. Let me bring this over so we can we can share. All right. Hope everybody can see that. Let me know if the sound is good. I'm going to go ahead and start playing some for uh, some for lecture. I've got the we we'll get the volume turned all the way up. Make sure everybody can hear it. All right. You don't want to, I, guys. She's got a thick accent. Okay. She she's uh, I'm, I'm I'm guessing her native language is Hebrew. So. She's got a thick English accent. You really want to pay attention. And I'm going to be stopping periodically because of what she's saying is just extremely potent for our apologetics to understand why um, people that are raised in Judaism don't believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. So, all right, hopefully this will bless you. Father, son, father, son, until the last high priest, Onias III, the son of Shimon, the son of Onias II, the son of another uh, Merayot and so on, the high priesthood, according to the biblical order, had been officiating in the temple for thousand years, from the time of Aaron, according, uh, according to biblical historiography, to the time of Onias III, who had been pushed away, who had been dethroned from the high priesthood. It's about thousand years. Now, just real quick, guys, in case you don't know who she's mentioning, Onias, or she's talking about the uh, the high priesthood, um, the sons of Zadok. This is second century BC. Okay, so she's kind of leading up into this error, but she's explaining this uh, through the high priesthood first of what she's been talking about. Not only he was pushed away, he was assassinated. His son Onias the Fourth ran away to Egypt. That's where Onias Temple had been. Uh, had been built and some of the ancient priestly lore had been kept. However, while the high priesthood of the biblical time had been dethroned, any did you guys just hear what she said? While the high priesthood of the biblical times had been dethroned, the reason she uses that word is because they were rulers. Leviticus chapter 8, Aaron's ordination as priesthood, he's given a crown. Yeshua. It's prophesied to be king and high priest, to rule in the midst of his enemies. This, she's talking about something that we don't have in the modern canon, and she's going to explain why. But this is some of the history of what's generically called the Second Temple period. But as for those of you who love timelines, you would, you would just think of it like the you know the time right leading up to the times of the Maccabees. And this is about the 3rd, 2nd century BCE. And this is also when she's going to suggest that this is when the Dead Sea Scrolls were actually buried. Now, there's people out there, there's other YouTube channels out there, a lot of other conversation out there that claims that, because she, she disagrees that the Essenes were the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but she does not believe that John the Baptist was the author of the Dead Sea Scrolls, like other popular YouTube channels try to, to uh, suggest. She's actually suggesting that they were already buried before John the Baptist was even alive by about 200 years by the sons of Zadok, a part of the priesthood who was actually persecuted and dethroned, which is more history and information that I'm going to be covering in Identity Crisis Part 2 
um, which is something I've been actively working on. So just it's important to remember because she's about to talk about how Onias, a part of this uh, Sons of Zadok high priesthood, had been dethroned and, and went to, is to uh, Egypt to build a, another temple. It gets, it gets the spicy. old priesthood had been nominated. We call it the Hellenized priest. The period is called the Hellenized priesthood. It's a short period. It is from 175 BCE to 159 BCE. At that time, Jason, Menelaus, and Alchemos were Hellenized high priests. That means they had accepted, they didn't have much choice, they had accepted the Antiochus king calendar and the Hellenistic decree. A group known as Hashmonians had came forward and started a war about 167 before the common era. It lasted until 164. When the war was over, there were no more Hellenized priests, but there was, lo and behold, a whole new priestly dynasty. Okay, guys, what she's saying, I'm actually going to uh, roll into this comment here from Kingdom Truther, because he's saying that all stuff found in the Dead Sea Scrolls is legit, though. Take, for instance, the Damascus document. I tested that from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it failed big time. I agree with you, Kingdom Truther. I actually do. And in fact, everything this woman's saying in her entire presentation, I don't agree with every single bit of it because she does not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. She is has been trained and raised in Judaism, but yet the information she's stumbling across within the Dead Sea Scrolls, she it it's causing her to think, and it's causing her to question what she's been taught. And this is where Yeshua fills in all these pieces. And I'm going to explain that after we listen to her. But I, I agree with you. There's not everything found in the Dead Sea Scrolls is legit. And this is where she even mentions part of the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves and how they were discovered uh, 70 years ago, yet they weren't even allowed to be studied until the 1990s. So this is something that you start to go, okay, wait a minute, why? Why weren't they allowed to be studied until the 1990s? This is this is where a lot of people have speculated. Well, what what's going on with the Dead Sea Scrolls? And that's why you have the you know the four Aramaic versions of Enoch that are held by private collectors, and no one can read them. And supposedly they're you know full intact copies uh, that are the best ones of all the things that were found. So there's clearly sh some shenanigans going on with the actual manuscripts that were found from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we don't know um, we don't know every single thing that was found in there. You you still want to test everything. You still want to test everything. Um, this is why we test many of these books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in honor of Kings. So she's going to mention several of them that are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that we've tested in honor of Kings. And then uh, she's going to mention some that, that we haven't tested yet. It is called Maccabean or Hashmonians. It's all the same. This is a group which have nothing to do with biblical priesthood. This is the bridge, this is the rift, this is the background where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. Because what was biblical Israel until about 164 before the Common Era, that's when Dan, the book of Daniel had been written. When it was biblical Israel, until the high priesthood had been destroyed, and three, uh, three Hellenized priests were officiating. The first one was direct connection with the ancient high priesthood. The second one was not connected at all. The third one was not connected at all. However, as I said, the Hashmonians, who were from the priestly tribe, waged war. They had fought against the Hellenized priests. They fought against the King Antiochus and they managed to a certain degree to succeed. However, not all the way through. They were nominated afterwards by the heirs of Antiochus. Alexander Balas and Demetrius were the two heirs of Antiochus who were fighting. And the Hashmonians, who were warriors, offered help to the powers, to the military forces of one heir of Antiochus, Alexander Balas, and others offered some help to the other heir of Antiochus, Demetrius the first and or the second, they were fighting those two kings. Once Alexander Balas had the upper hand, he had nominated Jonathan the Hashmonian to be a high priest. He was not from the high priesthood. He was not from the sons of Tzadok, the high priestly family, which was the only one that had officiated as high priest according to biblical Israel. Now, a new 
high priesthood had been nominated. Okay, guys, first of all, it's a couple different things here. Um, she's mentioning the, the, the time period of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, as we know from the book of the Maccabees, is during this, this second century BCE. Where this is what she's been talking about, this whole time period where they came in, they dethroned the actual reigning uh, descendants of Aaron who were in the proper lineage, who are also the sons of Zadok, and then they installed other people. And so we're actually going to go over the prophecies for that as well. But something I just want to address in the comments, guys, Stephen Schofield makes a makes a good comment. This can the reason why I want to address this is because this is where a lot of people get confused. And I just don't want anyone to be confused uh, as we review some things because of my time limitations. I, I just I can't go over the entire video. OK, but here's something that a lot of people conflate is the word Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a lot of manuscripts found in the quote unquote findings of Qumran of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So just put your mindset in the in the place of an archaeologist who's digging up a bunch of scrolls over 70 years. M many, many, many of those scrolls, hundreds of those scrolls were actual books that we still have in the Bible. Other writings that come out that are considered the Dead Sea Scrolls that people have tried to make books out of and sell. They're not including all the findings of the actual biblical books that were found at Qumran, which is the literal technical name of the cave system that we refer to generically as the Dead Sea Scrolls. So to say that you've read the Dead Sea Scrolls and they don't line up or they have issues, Surely someone's not conflating that to talk about the actual books of the Bible that were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, because that's that's the fullness of the archaeological dig that's still taking place today. So as long as the people understand the difference there, there are some there are some other books that have been printed that people have put together to sell that they title them Dead Sea Scrolls because they're, they're little small various manuscripts that felt that were not the books of Deuteronomy or Jeremiah or Isaiah or Enoch or Jubilees or Genesis. All those main books that we're already familiar with were found with the, with the writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, um, so just, just hopefully we're not conflating terms and ideas here. I just want everyone to be very clear. They had officiated apparently according to the Greek calendar. The Greek calendar is a lunar calendar, while the priestly calendar was a solar calendar. The Greek calendar was used, was based on human observation on the moon, changing calendar according to the day that the moon is rising. The solar calendar, the ancient solar calendar, according to the historiography of the scrolls, that had been composed by Enoch, son of Jared, in the seventh generation of humanity, who had been taught from the angels, who had been taught to read and write from the angels, who had been taught to calculate from the angels when he spent many years in heaven. On him, Enoch is the one on whom it is written in the book of Genesis, and Enoch walked with God, and then he was not because God had taken him up. Now, this is a very strange sentence in the book of Genesis chapter 5. It is extremely unusual in a line of people who are on each one of them, it is told, who had gave birth to them, to whom they had gave, had gave birth, how many years they had lived. On Enoch is the only one on whom it is said, Enoch had walked with God and then he was not because God had taken him. So Enoch didn't die. This Enoch, according to the book of Enoch, according to the first book of Enoch, the second book of Enoch, the third book of Enoch, and not all of them in Qumran, only the first one is in Qumran, and according to the book of Jubilee from Qumran, he is the one who had brought this 364 days calendar from heaven. This is the myth of the calendar claiming a very ancient origin to it. Enoch had stayed a year on earth after he had spent many, de many decades on heaven. He spent a year on earth to teach his son Methuselah, the calendar, who had taught it to his son, who had taught it to his son. This is the ancient calendar of the ancient priesthood, the pre-Diluvian priesthood. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, there have been a high priesthood of the pre-Diluvian time. The last one is Malkit Zedek. He was taken to heaven to keep the calendar there. 
According to them, Abraham had met Malkitzedek. In the days of Abraham, he is known as Kohen Le'el Elyon, Malkitzedek, the high priest for a high god. And he was granted the knowledge of the ancient priestly writing. Now, it is a myth. It is beyond what the Bible is telling us. But for the people who had written the Dead Sea Scrolls, the myth of the calendar was of paramount importance. Nothing could be more important. So Enoch had brought it from heaven, as it is delineated in the book of Enoch. Enoch has, had learned that from the angels, as it had been written in the book of Jubilees. Enoch is considered to be a priest of righteousness, as it is written in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and numerous other things about him. He was the first person who had learned to read, write, and calculate. He was the first person who offered incense. He's the one who inaugurated the temple worship in heaven. And there are numerous other stories to that effect, talking on the ancient origin of the calendar of 364 days of 52 weeks of pre-calculated precise order. Okay, guys. So I just want to jump in. That's the first segment we want to listen to. She, she, the main focus of her presentation is about the calendar and the Sabbath. So it's actually a, a different topic altogether, but it's this supplementary information that she's bringing forth to this conversation that I wanted to um, to let you listen to. Now, there's a couple more segments that we are going to listen to real quick, um, but I just want to let you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. James 122. There, she says some things in here that I don't agree with, like. She, she falls into some of the classic, um, I, I know what I'm about to say is going to sound crazy, but, you know, I'm sure she's well-intended, but there, <laughs> she falls in some of the classic unstudied misunderstandings and commonly mistaught ideas, kind of like she thinks that Enoch was actually in heaven, but she, She's even referencing the book of Jubilees, but doesn't seem to remember the part in Jubilees where it says he wasn't taken to heaven. He was taken inside the Garden of Eden for 300 years with the angels uh, or that the fact that Enoch did die. And in, in, as it says in Jubilees seven. So um, there's I don't agree with every single conclusion that she's making. I'm just just listen to the buildup that she's going to bring and that I'm putting with these clips here for you to explain what she's seen, the, this huge theme that she's seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls in these next two clips, she's going to really get into it, okay? And how it disagrees with Judaism, and she starts to call out what Judaism actually did, um, which causes people to miss Yeshua. All right, so let's uh, go to another segment real quick. Give me just a minute to cue it up. Okay as were designated according to the biblical order of the sacrifices. So whatever the priests were doing on earth and were not allowed to do anymore, those who were associated with the house of Tzadok, is being done in heaven by the angels. So for them, the priestly worship, which is eternal, the eternal cycles of Sabbath, Jubilees, appointed time of the Lord, fallow years, is carried on in heaven by the angels who are working according to the cycles of the calendar. Did you hear that, guys? Jewish professor telling you that the law is being kept in heaven, the Sabbaths are being kept in heaven. That's information that we only find in Jubilees. So what was lost on earth is perpetuated in heaven. What was lost on tangible things on earth is perpetuated in mystical music and song in the seven heavenly sanctuaries. Now those are... Did you guys hear just say the seven heaven? What's the word heaven mean? The firmament? What have we tried to explain about the biblical creation model from scripture? Yeah, she's, she's reading all these same ideas, all the themes... A kingdom in context, guys. She's reading all these same ideas in these Dead Sea Scrolls, and she's she's forming these unique ideas of questioning of, and she's going to get to these questions of why is there so much talk about angels keeping the law in heaven, how they interact with the priesthood on earth, the high priest was dethroned and new people were put in right before Jesus got on the scene. She's keep keep listening. Different kind of literature. The 52 songs of the Sabbath are described in the scroll of Psalms. The songs themselves that we had found and Carol Newsom had put together in a beautiful edition, Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, 
we have the descriptions of the angels working together with the priests. The priests are calling the angels to engage in the sacrificial work of the Sabbath in the heavenly sanctuary. We have the scrolls of the priestly watch telling us on which date and which day the sacrifices should be offered. We have the temple scroll to tell us what exactly is going on in the temple in relation to the sacrificial work. What is the order? How is it done? On what date? And so on. Those are different texts. All of them are corresponding to temple worship, to sacrifice, to priestly watches, to sacred calendar, all of them with no exception. Now, if I said there are about four or five distinctive things which are common denominator to most of these calls. One of them is solar calendar, sacred calendar of 364 days. One is holy place, Jerusalem, Mount Zion. One of them is angelic presence corresponding to priestly temple worship. And one of them is, one of them is sacred memory, which relates to the beginning of the priesthood. In Qumran, you begin the priesthood with Levi, I don't want you guys to miss this. I'm going to back it up, okay? She just said in Qumran, meaning in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you begin the priesthood with Levi. What have we been talking about? What does Jubilees 32 explain to us? That the, the priesthood that was carried down from Adam down to Jacob was passed on to Levi and this new covenant or, or this special contingency of covenant was made between Yahweh and Levi that, that at that point there, as Jubilees 32 explains, from Levi's descendants forward, the priesthood on earth will be through Levi's descendants. This is what Malachi chapter 2, verses 4 through 8 also is referencing. This is what both Tovia Singer and Asher Meza, both rabbis of Orthodox Judaism, refuse to acknowledge. ...of the priesthood. In Qumran, you begin the priesthood with Levi and not with Aaron, his grandson. You start the ancient pre-Diluvian priesthood with Enoch, you end the pre-Diluvian priesthood with Malkitzedek. We found the Malkitzedek scroll in Qumran. He's an angel priest. There are numerous angels. Now, the interesting thing is as follows. In the rabbinical literature that had been written and edited and composed in the first few centuries of the common era, it was put into writing later, but it had been discussed and oralized and edited in the first few centuries of the common era, there are no angels. I'm talking on the Mishnah and the Tosefta. There are no angels. There is no paradise. There is no Enoch. There is no calendar. All what was so important for the priests is utterly unknown in the early stratas of rabbinic Judaism. Okay, I just want to repeat this in case you can't understand her thick accent, okay? I'm, I'm sorry for stopping it too much, but I want to make sure everyone's following along. What she just said is that in that first century, early stractas or, or rabbinic Judaism writings, all this stuff of great importance that she's seeing within the Dead Sea Scrolls, talking about the priesthood and angels carrying out the law in heaven and how she's going to explain here in a little bit how the Torah was supposed to be passed on by the priesthood and how important it was. All those concepts are ignored and they're gone in early rabbinic Judaism in the Mishnahs. This is huge, guys. This is just stick with us. Keep, keep listening. Now to step one step backwards. I said that angels are present in each one of this, each section of this literature. In the war of scrolls of time of, of uh, in the war, sorry, in the scroll of war of sons of light against sons of darkness. The angels are conducting the war. The priests are fighting with horns. They don't have any kind of, uh, they're not really fighting as soldiers. They are fighting with horns, with trumpets, with musics, with angelic names. It is a mystical war. It's not an earthly war. Why do they call themselves sons of light? Because they believe in the solar calendar. Why do they call their opponents sons of darkness? Because they believe in the lunar calendar. So it was a calendar war more than anything. But the calendar was the basis of the covenant for people who believed in the biblical era, in the biblical order, in the sanctity of the biblical priesthood, in the sanctity of the temple worship, all what constituted ideal biblical Israel. 
I don't know if you guys are understanding just exactly how big of statements she just made. Rabbinical Judaism follows a lunar calendar. She's <laughs> she just said all these Dead Sea Scrolls talking about the priests all the way back to Aaron and Levi. They follow the, the Jubilees and Enoch calendar, 364 days, which is based off a solar calendar. And that was the literally integrally tied into the priestly duties in the covenant. Now, I, again, I'm showing you clips from this. You, you're welcome to go. Um, I, I think I put the link. I'll put the link to the to the actual um, uh, presentation in the description after it's over. But she goes into greater depth about the calendar and the Sabbath because that's what she's trying to explain is that it's based off the solar calendar, which is exactly what Enoch and Jubilees tells us. But in her day where she is, she's in Israel today with, you know, rabbinic Judaism strongly, strongly disagrees. And they followed this lunar calendar idea, which is different. She goes on to explain in other parts of her presentation how that idea was adopted from uh Babylonian Talmud practices, which actually came from the, the time of the third century CE in when Greece ruled the whole territory after Alexander had taken over everything, even Babylon. And so the sages and the, the quote unquote rabbis, the teachers that came out of Babylon who were infusing this rabbinic idea of Judaism and started to twist and change things, had adopted this lunar calendar from the Greeks and that it wasn't biblical at all. It was very, it was literally a point of contention with the sons of Zadok and the priesthood in Jerusalem that had, you know, been the descendants of, um, after the days of Nehemiah and Ezra. So what she's saying right now is huge. I don't say that that was the real order. I say that was the ideal order. Now at 175 BCE, when the priest of the house of Tzadok had been deposed and disrobed. They left Jerusalem at a certain point and took with them their library. That was the only thing they were allowed to take because you were not allowed to take anything of the temple materials or anything of the temple objects. They were sacred and they were not to be touched or living outside of the temple in any manner. The one thing which was not restricted according to any biblical law was the books in the temple library. We know from the father of Antiochus, Antiochus the Great, that he gave exemption for the authors of the, exemption for the scribes of the temple from a particular taxation. We know that there was a temple library and there was a temple, uh, there were temple scribes. Apparently, they took the temple library. There was no greater public library in Jerusalem. And what we had found in Qumran is first and foremost a huge library, which is composed of various things. But let's assume that the biblical scrolls, the huge amount number of like 270 biblical scrolls of the, 24, the 23 books of the Bible were found in Qumran, not the things that they had written there, basically things which had been in the temple library and were taken out. They continued to write all the various things that I talked about. And when I say that they were interested in holy time, in holy place, in holy ritual, in angel priestly common worship, in holy sacred memory, I would like to ask, what is the word that I had used most frequently, priestly. It is priestly awareness. It is priestly memory. It is priestly interest. However, guys, she's, <laughs> she is throwing mud in rabbinic Judaism right now. They refuse to acknowledge the priesthood. This is why they, they will not accept Yeshua because they're indoctrinated. It's a cult. They're indoctrinated to not accept the, or even understand or study or learn about the ideas of the priesthood and how important it was and how it was an agent of the Father, as Malachi 2, 4, 8 talks about. So therefore, when she starts bringing up all this stuff, <laughs> any rabbi in the crowd who's actually a part of Judaism, like they're, you know, they disagree vehemently with what she's saying, which is why they don't want you to understand or read the Dead Sea Scrolls. They don't, but what she's also saying is that these scrolls were taken out of a temple library and because of the persecution of the, the line of Onias, um, which was second century BC when the sons of Zadok, the priests that the rightful priests were being 
dethroned and deposed and taken away and they were put in these other these other priests that uh weren't truly the rightful line of high priests we've already and this was this isn't the first time this happened guys this all ha also happened in the days of ezekiel that led to the babylonian invasion deportation of the house of judah so uh it's it's what she's saying is is um pretty strong and it all points back to the importance of the priesthood and how the father views the priesthood she's mentioning how the angels are interacting with the priests on earth which is what we see in the torah guys this is what we've tried to explain when we reviewed in our kingdom portions and in many other places we also talk about it in our honor of kings videos with ken heiderbrecht we ever we go over how the the role of angels with mankind they, the angels themselves are their own priesthood they carry out the law in heaven this is why hebrews chapter one is comparing and contrasting the the role and the authority given to yeshua in his priesthood that was prophesied for him is greater than the priesthood of the angels in heaven this is the whole chapter of hebrews one it was a huge deal this is why in leviticus chapter nine the angel of the lord that's in the pillar of fire he's the one that's there He's the one that's that's literally presiding over the offerings that are bringing, being brought forth by Aaron and his sons because he's in greater authority than Aaron. He's the mediator. He's not the mediator, but he's the, um, as Exodus 23 says, I'm going to send my angel before you. He, he, he's not to be tested. He will not pardon your sins. So he's, he's the one in a priestly judge position, um, not in a priestly mediator position because He's standing there in a almost like a security guard, if you will, in a judge role, um, which is also a facet of the priesthood. And that's why in uh, Levi's two sons that brought forth strange fire, fire comes out from the angel that's there. It's the angel of the presence. He comes out from the from the fire, the tabernacle, which was what he descends on, just like he descended on the tent of meeting and spoke with Moses face to face because he's the conduit. He's the agent speaking the words of God to Moses. This, this goes into people trying to, uh, translators, capitalizing the G when it says that Moses spoke with God face to face. It's Moses spoke with Elohim in the Hebrew. Elohim is a word used of angels. So what she's trying to express in her breakdown of all these different scrolls within the Dead Sea findings is that there was an, there was an, like a, a hand in hand uh, situation where Angels from heaven are participating with the temple on the ground with the priesthood that was on the ground as well. Now, many of you may know, and this is a whole nother presentation, that in the two to three hundred years leading up to the days of Yeshua, the, the temple that was there in Jerusalem, the high priests, the day of atonement was going wrong. Things were happening poorly. They, uh, there's, there's stories from rabbis how they, um, they, they would close the temple doors and then they would be open again in the morning and uh, sacrifices weren't being accepted like they thought they should be. There was all these things that were happening that were awry from what we see as an example in the Law and the Prophets. Because of exactly what she's saying, they the Greeks had come in and replaced the actual priesthood that was supposed to be the lineage of Levi, down through Aaron, down through Zadok. So by the time Yeshua gets there, he's dealing with a corrupt priesthood. And of course they don't believe him they reject him because why because the prophecy of the messiah is the father is going to send his son to become a high priest and these are the very guys that are trying to steal that position guys this, there's so much to this let me go to the last clip real quick and then we'll uh we'll take some questions and if it's there should be the final 24 books of the canon were the closure of creative sacred writings or creative holy scriptures according to the rabbis they did not allow any continuity of writing now there were many books which were not chosen to be within the biblical canon such as the book of enoch the book of jubilees the book of the 12 tribe the songs of the sabbath sacrifice the temple scroll all of them are sacred writings with no exception all of them are talking about Did you guys hear what she just said enoch jubilees book of the 12 tribes that's the testament of the 12 patriarchs which were also found in the dead sea scrolls she says all of them are sacred writings but listen to what she says next she tells you why they weren't put in the jewish bible 
heavenly issues, angelic issues, divine commandment, halachic things. However, they were excluded. Why would they exclude, be excluded? Because the rabbis, so to say, had decided that any book which is focusing on priests and angels and has any allusion to this 364 days calendar would be deemed as Sfarim Chitzonim, which means the books which are left outside, the external books. We call them in English pseudoepigrapha or apocrypha, but in Hebrew it's more precise. It's the books which were left outside. They were left outside by Rabbi Akiva, who is telling us in the Sanhedrin, anyone who will read in the external books, those which were left outside, has no share in the world to come. That's a very strong act of censorship. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? She's saying the rabbis in the, in, in the times of the uh, first, second, third century when they were compiling their own canon and they were leaving out these other books that they literally called in Hebrew the books that were left out. Um, later, they were given the terms pseudopigraphal, apocryphal, things like that. She's saying that the rabbis were teaching people at the time if you read those books, you have no share in eternal life, meaning you don't you don't basically get the benefit of the covenant with God. This is the indoctrination because why? Why would they even? Why? She's going to go into it. It's going to make sense with the other two clips that we just listened to. Here we go. However, those books which were left outside are the books that we had found in the Qumran library. Now, we know this dispute as the dispute between Pharisees and Sadducees. In Hebrew, Pushim Vetzdukim. Sadducees are the priests from the house of Tzadok. That's all what it means, Sadducees. Later on, they had bad reputation because of their role in the New Testament, because of their fighting with the rabbis. But the priests from the house of Tzadok, who had written and who had officiated in the temple for a thousand years before the common era, had their own memory, had their own visual perception, had their own conceptual world, and they fought for it. The rabbi said, any book with 364 days calendar, any book with priest angels, any book about Levi, about the sons of Levi, about the work of Levi, and so on, would be, of course, outside. There is no need for that for other generations. Guys, she just told you the rabbis in the early, early uh, first, second, third centuries, they're telling, they're teaching others that any book that's considered left outside, any book of Enoch, Jubilees, any, which is the books that have the 364 day calendar based off the sun, any book, <laughs> any book that talks about Levi, any book that talks about the priesthood or the angelic priesthood, that they're not for people to read and understand. This, it, like, you know, she said already, it's censorship, but this is where we get the amazing twisting. So therefore, when you take all those things out, you don't have the tools to understand Yeshua's role as our high priest and Messiah. It's what's prophesied of him. Psalm 110, 1 4. This is why when I have the debate with Asher Mesa and I'm asking him, well, what do you think of Psalm 110, 1 4? He's like, oh, it's David. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not David. David doesn't rule forever. David doesn't sit at the right hand of the Father. David's in Sheol waiting to be pulled out at the resurrection, Psalm 16, 10. Peter even tells us so in Acts chapter 2. Like they, the Jewish mindset of the first century, they knew David wasn't getting resurrected. They knew the definition of the covenant, which is the resurrection. Or excuse me, they knew David wasn't the Messiah being spoken of in Psalm 110 because they knew that everyone who dies from Adam to the day of the Lord is waiting for the resurrection. This is what the writer of Hebrews Someone that understood the Torah, the law, the priesthoods, all the things that are being mentioned here. That's what they explain to us in Hebrews chapter 11, that everyone is waiting for the promise to be fulfilled together. It's, it's the day of the Lord, the first resurrection. It's the promise of eternal life. But the rabbis of this day, the same group of rabbis that rejected Yeshua and killed them and, just, and persecuted the disciples, they're the ones that ran around telling people, we, we've gathered all these books up that's going to help you understand messiah better and help you understand what these disciples are trying to tell you and we don't want you to read those guys if you the first century believers the, the disciples of jesus and jesus himself had all these books at their availability they had this information they had this perspective this mindset so when they went out and they did not have a new testament and they went out to the surrounding peoples and they explained yeshua as the high priest people believed it made sense. 
This is why we talk about it so much on this channel. It is one of the greatest ways to evangelize the hearts and minds of people because it's a logical process that the Father put in play between mankind, between mankind and God, which is Yeshua who mediates between the two. And it's not literally him dying on the cross that does it because that's not the process Yeshua mediates between. Yeshua died on the cross, yes. He was buried in the heart of the earth, in the grave, and he was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and he was resurrected. Yes, yes. That's the story of his life, death, and resurrection. But his eternal life after that is what was prophesied to him to step into this high priest role so that he could mediate atonement for our sins. This is so important for us to be able to communicate to people. So when we go out there and we say to people that, oh, Jesus died for your sins, that just goes right over people's heads. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. What does that mean? What did mean? Are you trying to say like God's into human sacrifice? No, he's not. He's not. The, Jesus was murdered unjustly. The father foretold that because he knew what was going to happen when he sends a righteous son into a, a wicked and adulterous generation. They're going to lie about him. They're going to seek to kill him, which is exactly what the corrupt false priesthood did. Let's finish this clip and we're going to go to some scriptures real quick, okay? We chose those books that we believe that would be meaningful for later generation. We won't choose the temple scroll because it is not relevant. There is no more temple. We won't choose the priestly watches scroll, the scroll of priestly watches because there are no more priestly watches because there is no more temple. So we can explain why they left them outside, but it hasn't been noted enough that all what's important to the priest is utterly put aside in the rabbinical new literature. I'll give one example to make it uh, understandable. The word covenant, brit, is one of the most frequent words in the scrolls of the, in the, scrolls of the Dead Sea. The covenant between God and his people, God and the priests, uh, people of Israel and God. The word covenant is a major word. The word covenant in that meaning is completely erased from the Mishnah. There is no such word anymore. So as I said, what is central in the priestly literature is unseen or unwitnessed in the new rabbinical emerging literature. They had a new agenda. The priests were overlooked. When they describe the chain of transmission of the Torah, they don't mention this. They don't mention the priest at all. They deleted them. In the Bible, it is said that the Torah has to be taught and transmitted by the priest. Very, very clearly it is said so. Moses says so to, to his tribal brothers, the Levites, that they should teach the statutes of J to the people of Jacob, to the people of Israel, the law to the people of Jacob, and so on. It is obvious that the priests in the Bible are entrusted with the biblical transmission of the law. According to the rabbis in the chapter of the fathers, they were never priests at all in the biblical transmission. So what they care, what one group care a great deal, the other group erased altogether. She's, there, she, there you have it, guys. She's talking about the rabbis. They deleted, they censored, they erased everything about the priesthood. The priesthood all the way back from Enoch to Levi. Uh, <laughs> that's, they don't want you to understand Yeshua. So they come in. Think about this strategy, guys, because what we're doing is we're breaking down the strategy of the enemy. We're breaking down the doctrines of demons right now, okay? And this is what she's bringing to light with her studies. Um through her perspective, she's kind of stumbling onto this. And uh, like someone said in the comments earlier, she, she's close to becoming a believer in Yeshua, in my opinion. Because once she starts to read the New Testament where it explains Yeshua's priesthood, then she's been like, oh, wow. Yeah. No wonder Jesus called these people brood of vipers and liars and murderers. Because that's exactly what they're doing. They're killing the priests off. They're trying to steal that job, that position, which was one of rulership and one of doctrine, right? So they could sway the people with bad doctrine. And they can control them and they want to get rid of the son of god who was coming and the, the torah made flesh right that the word that came in the flesh he was the one that was uh stepping into this rightful priesthood role that was prophesied of him so she's i think she's close in my opinion may, may god soften her heart to his son and actually bring her to the truth because she's now she has the theological component pieces to understand the role of the messiah with with wonderful clarity so may the father bring her to that conclusion but ultimately 
it, she's telling you right here that that I mean that the strategy that, that was implored in the first few centuries after Yeshua came, they wanted to get this information away from the subsequent generations afterwards so that no one could understand Jesus, which then here comes the Catholic priests who are already taking the words out of context and infusing Babylonian ideology and Trinitarian concepts of actual human sacrifice and transubstantiation, which are, which are paganist ideas. And they're trying to put that onto the storyline of Yeshua, which only creates more confused converts and a very uninformed, shallow and superficial um, believer who is easily swayed into bad doctrine. And it's just, you know, it's, it's an attack in every single way on sound doctrine and on the, the actual no the knowledge of God that first Peter talks about that is going to help you understand the Messiah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's bad guys, but let's look real quick at this priesthood that she's talking about. We actually see this in the Testament of the 12 patriarchs. Remember that book that she said, the book of the 12 tribes, this is what she, this, the ones found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is what she's talking about, guys. This is the, uh, the Testament of the 12 patriarchs. And we go into the Testament of Levi in chapter 18, and he's actually talking about the priesthood in prophecy that was failed. And he actually read, he, I'm not going to be able to read the entire book of Levi to you, but this is, this is a book that's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he, he talks about how he, that Levi, son of Jacob, read the book of Enoch and knew that his descendants and during the time of the, the arrival of the Messiah, that his descendants having the priesthood would fail and be corrupted at that time. Let's read it real quick. So it says in chapter 18, he says, after their punishment shall have come from the Lord, the priesthood shall fail. Then shall the Lord raise up a new priest. That's the Messiah. And to him, all the words of the Lord shall be revealed, and he shall execute a righteous judgment upon the earth for a multitude of days. His star shall arise in heaven as of a king, lighting up the light of knowledge as the sun the day. And he shall be magnified in the world. He shall shine forth as the sun on the earth and shall remove all the darkness from under heaven. And sh there shall be peace in all the earth. The heaven shall exalt. Of course, he's talking about the second coming at this point. He shall shine uh, and the earth shall be glad and the clouds shall rejoice. So it's this is just, it's this very first verse is what I just kind of wanted to, to show you right here. Um, because he's talking about how after their punishment comes from the Lord, that's when they're both scattered, both houses are scattered. The priesthood shall fail. And this is what we see coming up to um, uh, the days that the most the, the Lord raises up a new priest, which is Yeshua. And so there's there's other places here. This is, we could do a whole breakdown on the book of, of Levi, and we will uh, continue to do that in honor of Kings when we have time. But also, guys, just in case you you know didn't realize, like this this is the storyline of of our Messiah that he was destined to be, become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek before the Lord. And so let's look at this real quick. We'll go to some passages that, that make that abundantly clear in case you're new to scripture or if this is the first time you've ever seen this because someone shared it with you. Or in case that you are currently um, in rabbinic Judaism and you're actually testing these ideas tonight and you found this video and you're like, wow, what in the world? Um, how could someone, you know, how can a Jewish professor actually be saying that? So let's look here in Hebrews chapter 5. Okay, this is a first century Hebrew who is explaining Jesus Christ through the priesthood, Yeshua HaMashiach, through the priesthood that they were also very familiar with. And so in verse 5 through 10, he tells us, So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Just as he also says in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the writer of Hebrews explaining that Christ did not put himself in that role, but the Father put him in that role, which is why in verse 6 he's quoting Psalm 110, verse 4. And then in verse 7 through 10, he says, In the days of his flesh, that's Yeshua, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety, although he was a son. By the way, guys, this death that he's, I talked about this last night. The, what it says right here in verse 7, that he was able to, the, the one able to save him from death. Well, Yeshua died, right? He was, he was dead for three days. He was resurrected. That's because Yeshua didn't consider the first death truly death. He considered it just going to sleep in Sheol, which is what the Old Testament teaches. This is why he's saved from the second death, because he's raised, because he was righteous. And 
This is why it says because of his piety. Although, verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, that's he's glorified in his resurrected body, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Why would it say to those who obey him? Because a, a high priest, as verse 6 says, a high priest is put in a position of rulership over Israel. Guys, your, your ruler, just like Moses and Aaron were put in a position of rulership over Israel, and when Korah and the other, other tribal leaders tried to rebel against that leadership, they were taken out by Yahweh. The Father has given you a ruler and a leader. He's given you the firstborn among many brethren. He's given you your king and your high priest. His name is Yeshua of Nazareth, the Son of God that was sent. And he becomes to all those who obey him, a source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is what Revelation 3.5 explains to us, that he calls our names out at the resurrection in front of the Father and the angels, and we're raised from the dead. This is the authority that's been given to the Son of Man. This is what is explained in the book of First Enoch, one of the very books that this Hebrew University professor, Rachel Elior, says that was removed from the Jewish people by the rabbis in the first century. So if you're watching this, I really hope that you, um, I really hope that you've been blessed by this. I really hope it causes you to study uh, the, the amazing son of God that was sent for you. And I hope that you come to a saving faith in him. I really do. I hope that he changes your heart and, and you start to realize that you've been lied to but the truth is there and it's right. All you have to do is read it. You just literally have to read it. It makes perfect sense with the Tanakh, complete perfect sense with the priesthood, with the law of God, regardless of what you may have heard about from some, you know, mainstream church that has very poor theology. Yeshua keeps the law. Yeshua taught all of his disciples to keep the law. Yeshua steps into a role as a priesthood where he keeps the law. Yeshua ministers the law on behalf of mankind to the Father because it's the Father's law. And he's all, all you have to do is believe in him to the point where you are adopting his behavior and you're casting off the traditions that interfere with you doing the behavior of Jesus. And you're walking what first century Hebrew James called the law of liberty. And so that's my prayer that you would do that. So, guys, I, I, if you have any questions um, and you're watching this, please please put them in all caps, and that way that I can um, I can see them easily because sometimes the chat moves pretty fast and I can't see all the questions. But hopefully, Sean M's asking about the Dadaki or the Dachi, depends on how you want to say it. Um, haven't studied it thoroughly from what I have studied from what I have seen. Um, I don't. I don't, it's not something that interested me to the point of wanting to study it further, but I can look at it further in the future. But from what I did see, it, it did not seem to be valid. But I feel bad even saying that, Sean, because I don't, because I haven't studied to the point where I can make like an official conclusion. Okay. Chloe Walker, there's a whole bunch of different books that were not put in the American Bible or that used to be in the American Bible actually were taken out. So there's a whole, there's books like, like I read from the Testament of Twelve Patriarchs tonight, that's found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. That wasn't put in the Jewish Bible or in the Christian Bible. That was not. That was actually in an Armenian canon in nineteen uh, in sixteen sixty seven, I think it was. So, but it was also with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so it's just been preserved through different various smaller canons that are lesser known. Um, but like the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch, uh, you know, Book of Second Ezra, Baruch, those are all found in the Ethiopian Orthodox canon. Um, it's just you just have to do some research if you haven't already seen our, our series honor of kings It's on my playlist here on the channel kingdom of context go to my playlist check out honor of kings season one two And we're currently doing season three and we go over all of those books and I give you history for them So it's just a lot of information to cover in, in a quick answer Marsha, yes, because this is the calendar that is shown to Enoch And it's the calendar that's revealed to Moses in Jubilees. It's yeah, it's the one that they, they keep in heaven 
Uh, James 1.22, the Temple Scrolls speaks about first fruits, new wine, new oil, wood offering. Will these line with the same first fruits spoken in Nehemiah 10, 35, and 37? Um, I don't remember. Let me go to Nehemiah 10 real quick. Uh, there's some things in the Temple Scroll that, um, at least the version of the Temple Scroll that we have, and that's that's part of the, the eyebrow raise about the specific Temple Scroll, is every time I try to study it, there's there's a lot of questionable history around the manuscript itself. And so this is where, and there's actually people that make inferences about what the temple scroll says to support the question that you're asking. So that's probably going to be a separate show, um, but I'll try to address this just real quick. Nehemiah 10, 35 and 37, because remember in Deuteronomy, it talks, it mentions the things that are brought with the first fruit offerings, but it doesn't say specifically there should be four different first fruit offerings. So let's look at it real quick. Uh, verse 35, I'll put this on screen for people to follow. Verse 35 is what he's asking about through 37. That they might bring the first fruits of our ground, the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord annually, and bring to the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks, as it's written in the law, for the priests who are ministering in the house of God. House of our God. We will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the new wine, the oil of the priests, the chambers of the house of God, the tithe of our ground, leave it. Yeah, this is just like Deuteronomy. Um, and again, that's where I was saying that look closely at what you're being told about the temple scroll and look closely to how people try to infer and factor that out into four separate feasts when we do not get that from nehemiah we do not get that from jubilees we do not get that from deuteronomy so um there's a what i've seen that teaching being presented there's a lot of inference and there's a uh, i just don't see it literally spelled out so this is where yeah, I'm going to do a separate show of the Temple Scroll in the future, okay, brother? But that's a good question. Uh, Vigilant Watchman, yes, I do. Go to my, my go to my playlists on my channel and go to the debates playlist. And you can actually, uh, I do debates on there <laughs> that are um, breaking down the Trinity in great regard. I have an entire playlist called Son of the Father, and I break down Trinitarian arguments from like five different videos from five different angles. So there's two playlists that, I, that I'd encourage you to check out. One of them is called hashtag son of the father. And the other one is my debates playlist. And you'll get, you'll get so much to watch uh, to break down the errors in the Trinity doctrine. Um, thank you, Miss. Uh, thank you, Miss Morgan. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, this is why I was saying like, we're trying to get up to like 300 uh, patrons um, on, on Patreon so that we can actually you know, afford to do the documentary properly and with the right equipment. And I actually literally would have to go to Ethiopia, interview some people. So this is, um, yeah, pray for us that we can get that done. Okay. XRP test dummy is asking, how can we defend against the secular argument that infant circumcision is mutilation? Um, well, I mean, it depends on. Uh, this is a this is a hot topic, guys. Um, we have shown we have an entire video that's called "Does Circumcision Still Apply?" and uh, we we show from Scripture how it does apply in the covenant. It's not an entryway in the covenant, but it is an additional command that once you you know are it's a sign that you are in covenant. You know, so it's usually something that you've done after you've come to faith and belief. But we do defend the idea of circumcision uh, because you're using the term infant circumcision and the reason i'm bringing this up is because it's literally an eternal command in exodus 12 that is to be done for an infant who's eight days old so um it, it's not mutilation uh it's apparently it was able to be done with a sharpened rock on the side of the road in exodus chapter was it chapter two by zipporah moses's wife she she grabbed a sharp flint rock and snipped off uh what was it gershom so I know that there's this huge argument between like how much they cut off and whether that was how much they took off in the past or whether it was a smaller amount in the past. All I know is it could be done without medical doctors and without nurses and without a hospital. It was literally done on the side of the road with a flint rock in haste. So, and Gershom was fine. So all I know is that uh, it's not, you know, he was a grown man though, but it's not it's not mutilation that's that's an argument against people that 
do not like the eternal command because the father said it's a sign of the covenant and these people really struggle against that they really do they get all into their feelings <laughs> and they're not even the ones getting circumcised it's usually the mothers it's 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 wild all right guys Uh, Clovis Sunquist is asking a genealogy question about proving Yeshua is from David via Solomon. Um, I'm not sure exactly. I I know it sounds like a succinct question, but it's it's such a loaded question that you're asking me. I don't know which like angle you're trying to ask it. So um, I'd almost say it's not. I want to I want to address it, which is why I'm highlighting it to look at it. But at the same time, it's hard for me to give you. I don't know exactly what kind of answer you're wanting. I mean, we've got the genealogies in the New Testament um, that actually show us a descendancy, you know, both in Matthew 1 and Luke 3. And it just depends on, I don't know exactly what vein you're asking this question, uh, Clovis. I apologize. And I think this is actually something that we, we talked about last night as well. As far as this particular passage, I think Wes plays asked this question last night um, because this is this is not a genealogy. First, Chron First Chronicles 17, 11 through 14 is not an actual genealogy. It's just a prophecy about uh, someone from the house of David being established on the kingdom throne forever. So uh, maybe clarify your question. I'll try to come back to it. OK. Thank you, Bill Crack. I appreciate it. Thanks, brother. All right, David Shearer is asking a question from Miss Janet, saying, "Can you please explain this verse and what are you bind on earth should be bound in heaven? What are you loose on earth should be loose in heaven?" From Matthew sixteen nineteen. Uh, personally, for me, I, you know, I think this is one of those situations where, um, if if you look at uh, the surrounding context, I don't, I don't profess to have the best answer for this particular statement for right off the bat. Okay. But for me, to me, it sound, it seems like a proleptic statement about what we're promised as part of the covenant, which is to be a royal, a royal priesthood, you know, Exodus 19.5. And in that royal priesthood, we, we participate in that royal priesthood in the New Jerusalem, where we then have authority and power, and that is called the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, we can actually take command over things that are going wrong against Torah, which is why... This, during the millennial reign, when the kingdom of heaven is on the ground and all the nations of the earth come to it to learn Torah, as Isaiah 2, 2 through 5 explains, that means they're going to be learning Torah from the priests, which is going to be the saints, the resurrected priesthood that comes into eternal life and this priesthood in the order of Melchizedek under Yeshua. So therefore, we'll be teaching the Torah to all the nations and therefore we'll be able to uh, bind and loose, which is, from my understanding, is a uh, idiomatic phrase and terminology associated with a ruler or a judge who's exacting exacting um, judicial judgments, right? Whether you're you're binding someone in judgment or you're loosening them in mercy, uh, according to the, the the rulership and the uh, you know your your decision making according to Torah. So, sorry if it's a little bit of a long answer, but that's that's my understanding of it. Okay, Clovis. So I've heard this argument before. Thank you for clarifying. So what what most people claim is that um, they we since we don't have the most perfect genealogies between the era from Solomon to Jesus, because what did we just talk about tonight? The rabbis of that day were trying to hide everything about Jesus's rightful lineage, um, which was a big deal for them, right? And especially because he was prophesied to become of a high priest, which we have from Mary's side that she was, uh, you know, her cousin was John the Baptist. And so, or Jesus's cousin was John the Baptist. And so you've got him in the family of Levites connected slightly. And some people believe that the Joseph being mentioned in Mary's genealogy, and I think I'm getting this right, is actually through, uh, is not the same Joseph that's mentioned as the father of Mary. I said that wrong. That, that there's a Joseph in Mary's genealogy, which is different than the Joseph who was the father, the adopted father of Jesus. 
if I could put it like that. I think that's I think that's the argument that I've been hearing. Personally, I haven't studied it in great depth, to, so I apologize for the, the half answer, I guess I should say. But that's what I remember people complaining about. And that's that's what I remember reading about as far as um, the most logical answer from the manuscripts that we have today, according to the genealogies that are presented in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, is that people are assuming that they're uh, at some point in the genealogy, there's people with the same names, which is very, very common in in Israel and Hebrew amongst Hebrew people naming their kids. They like all have the same names in these family trees. It's very, very common. So it's not the best answer for you, but hopefully it it's something to consider. All right, JIB, no, I have not. I think I missed a question further up here. Um, Sean M is asking about Abraham being renamed. He says, when Yahweh renamed Abram, did it anoint him in his power or word? Um, no, no. It, you know, if it's something just to help someone mentally have more identity, um, as far as them connecting themselves with the sense of purpose or what God's promised of them. Uh, before Abram was given the name Abraham, he was already promised things, and he was already in covenant for a long time. The Book of Jubilees says he believed in Yahweh at the age of 14 and actually uh, decided to pursue God in his heart and his mind uh, to find truth and to, to walk in the ways of the Creator by the age of 14. So we we get, in Genesis, we don't get all that backstory. We just It just picks up when he's like 75 years old or something. So um yeah he's he was already what anoints you in your word and your power is your obedience to god's behavior which is the commandments so it's not just a the father giving you a different or amplifying or augmenting your name oh there's a question i miss uh royce bell is asking um a question that is a is a fun question and it says hey brother i have a question has it hasn't it been six thousand years since the fall this is where it depends on which calendar you're going by and this is this is in my opinion another one of the topics that rabbinical judaism has intentionally interfered with so that people do not know um they claim according to their traditions they claim that there's only going to be 6,000 years and then the 7,000th year is the millennial reign, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's not something that I've ever seen in scripture. So uh, the book of Adam and Eve talks about 5,500 years and then the, you know, the, the day of redemption happens and that's easily debunked uh, from all the history that we have in the scriptures. But, but between the Greek and the, and the Masoretic, you have two different historical timelines um, some people don't know if it's truly six or seven thousand years in the whole span of, of the, the whole game or if it's going to be longer, if it's going to be 10,000 years. Just we don't know. So it's uh, it's still a mystery. All right, Clovis is asking another question. Clovis, I have a question for you. Are you pulling out arguments from Judaism, anti-missionary arguments from Judaism, or are you a follower and practitioner of Judaism? Um, because if you are, that's okay. I'm glad you're watching. But I think that your arguments are very pointed. So I just I'll, let's get to Jeremiah um, chapter 22, 28 through 30. This one is just a context issue. We're keen in context. You want to you want to look at context. So you're asking, was Jeconiah's curse reversed in Jeremiah 22? So let's go there for everyone else to follow along. And I'll put it on screen. So this is going to be in verses 28 through 30. All right. Um, if, if you read the surrounding passage, of Jokaniah or Joachim. 
depends on, you know, that I'm sorry. I'm trying to I apologize, guys. I'm trying to highlight this so I can read it. But this is what the actual passage is. You're saying there's more context to it. These are the three verses that you've highlighted. I'll read them for the sake of posterity. But please go read all the surrounding context. This is just talking specifically about um, uh, this guy, this particular guy who's unrighteous. So it says, is this man, Kaniah, a despised shutter jar? Or is he an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been hurled out and cast into land they had not known? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down, childless, a man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper, sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. So this is where it's just for him and his family, brother or sister. I'm not sure if Clovis is a, I'm not sure if your brother or sister, but it's, it's not for anyone after him. The father is not going to interrupt his covenant with David for the sake of this man's disobedience. How many times after this do we have prophecy for the sake of David that he will continue to put a man on the throne and for the sake of David? We see it in Ezekiel, um, uh, at the latter portions of Ezekiel, which is written after this, this moment here in Jeremiah. So we also see it in the book of Baruch. We also see it in uh, Psalm 110. So, yeah, we'd have to remember, you know, some of the timeline chronology, but this was a specific one just for this dude and his his unrighteousness, his disobedience. But this does not break the covenant that the father made with David as far as, you know, I'll have a man on, on the throne of David, which is a moniker for in your place of kingship over Israel. So this is what was prophesied of the Messiah. So therefore, what I guess I'm trying to say is, if the argument that you're posing, which is a classical, it's actually not even the most prominent argument that you hear from anti-missionaries, but it is one that's brought up um, for very, very unstudied new converts that they try to trick. This one is ripped out of so much context that if you applied it the way that it tries to be argued, not only would it break the covenant with David that Yahweh claims cannot be broken, but it would, literally would nullify any Messiah ever coming. And rabbinical Judaism still believes the Messiah is coming. So, you know, this argument has a lot of issues with it. I know, AC, I, I know that's the pattern that we've been told that we've been, um, that people talk about this. Like, like I said, I just, it sounds like a wonderfully fitting pattern. And I, hey, man, I, <laughs> You know, I think it would be cool if that was true. Uh, if I could find an actual scripture that says it, I'm down, I'm okay with that. I'm down with that. What is the the current rabbinic uh, calendar is like 50, I don't know, what is it, like 50, 57 something right now. I can't remember, 57, 90 or something like that. So approximately like 200 more years until 6,000 years are fulfilled. But that's, I mean, even I don't I don't go by that stuff because I don't see that in actual scripture that we have available to us today. If it is out there somewhere to be revealed later, that'd be amazing. I I personally think it's probably in the lost portions of 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 Enoch from the different six different manuscripts of Enoch that comprise the book of First Enoch that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, there's a those are fragments of six different scrolls. So the rest of those scrolls, the, if we had all six of those scrolls in their full totality. I would not put it past to have some sort of prophecy that does tell us the exact timeline, but we just don't have it. So, uh, you know, we all want him to, we all want the father to come back soon. Father and the son, Enoch 105, one through two, the father and the son will descend and, and dwell on mankind with the earth. This is Ezekiel 37. We all want that to happen as soon as possible, but I don't want to go off bad information. And I don't want to guess, you know, I just try to be as, as, um, open to investigation as possible that's that's how i got to where i am today so okay guys if you have any questions put them in all caps otherwise uh we've been going to to we're here at the end of our broadcast all right vigilant watchman go check out my i just answered this last night um, it's in Revelation 13. It's associated with the second beast who comes after the first beast is revealed. And um, and I personally, what mechanism is it? Is it an actual chip? Um, I don't know if it's a literal chip or not uh, that's inserted in the hand of the forehead. 
if that's the actual mechanism. But I do know that the hand and forehead are associated. I know some people want to say it's the commandments, uh, it, which you should bind on your hand or your, you know, keep them on your forehead as far as put them in your actions and put them on your forethought and every waking thought, which is, which is commandment. And therefore they attribute the inverse of that to be the mark of the beast is, which is you would have his commandments or his lawlessness in your hands and in your thoughts, you know? So I know that some people try to go that route with it. And, you know, I, I respect their opinion. I'm just not decided on if that's what it is. I personally don't know what the mechanism of it is, but I know that the context of the timing of what if that is, and I talked about that last night in the Q and A last night. So if you want to go check that out, you're welcome to. All right, guys, I'll take one more question and we'll end for the night. I really appreciate you guys showing up. I hope this was a blessing to you. Hit like, share, and subscribe. Um, we got 112 people watching right now. If everyone just hit the like button, if it blessed you, um, this would really help us in the algorithms and uh, just, that's it's, it's easy for you to do just go boop. <laughs> all right last question guys um armin danielian is asking you mentioned before you saw miracles uh and demons etc do you see those often now what do you what do you do what jesus asked us to do what's your thoughts uh i don't i didn't say that i saw miracles or demons to be honest with you um i've had some some messed up dreams um, but I never saw demons outright. I talked about a friend who who went through an exorcism in a previous show, but and I had uh, gifts of the spirit happen through me. That's called words of knowledge. I don't know if you're calling that a miracle or not, but so I'm not sure, brother. If that's um, I'm not sure if you're mistaking me for someone else you're watching or not. But um, no, I, like I said when I did mention those in the past, I. The, the gifts of the spirit that were that were happening to me at that time this is called words of knowledge where i was getting information about people that you wouldn't normally have for the purpose of ministry um i actually asked the father to turn that down because i was uh it was interrupting my ability to function in in normal life and so i i asked him to turn it down and i'm sure if i asked him to turn it up in the future he could i personally think that he's flowed me into a different vein of ministry like he's given me the gift of teaching so that's a totally different gift of the spirit uh that's why you're watching me now so because mr bear the mccalcedek concept and we actually talked about this i'm not sure if we talked about this in our milk and meat presentation that my wife and i did with uh, ken heidebrecht as our guest um, guys if you haven't already when and subscribe to Ken's channel, go do that now. Ken Heidebrecht's Hanging on His Words. Uh, it's actually on my recommended channels on the playlist. You can find it on YouTube. Go subscribe to him. He's got great, great content. We talked about the angelic priesthood in, in our presentation that we did for Milk and Meat and, and about how Adam is being taught the Torah and Adam becomes his own priest. And this is why, you know, Genesis 3.15, that Eve is told that your husband will rule over you because now Adam's in that position of rulership that the angels were in when they were in the garden with the angels but now that they're out of the garden and adam is the authority over the family he's about to create and also the uh he's the authority over over eve he's also the, the priest of that family and he's the first high priest of mankind on earth that gets passed down this is also why there's a fight between cain and abel as they're doing the law and bringing forth sacrifices so it's it's not really a situation of the you know it's the basically the priesthood that's with levi the reason why hebrews chapter 7 is showing you the difference is because the levitical priesthood was based on genealogy you had to be born from the descendancy of levi in order to qualify for that priesthood the mckelsedekian priesthood has no qualifier like that so it can be passed on easily as a different order between the angels who carry it in that priesthood in heaven and then given right down to Adam, and that's passed down to the the Mechelsedek we see in Genesis 14 that Abraham goes and pays tithes to. And by the way, if you look closely in Genesis 14 and then Jubilees uh, 14, where Jubilees 13, where it mentions the Mechelsedek and Abraham giving tithes to him, this is that there's priests with that Mechelsedek. There's so it's not just one guy; it's a group. It's multiple servants that are serving in some sort of capacity some sort of sanctuary some sort and they're priests of the most high god they're righteous they're, these are the guys that have been trained and they're being passed down this is why we see abraham doing priestly duties this is why jubilees is explaining just as genesis explains that the secession 
of the priesthood from Adam down to Jacob and then down to Levi. So things change as far as circumstantial qualifiers when we get to Levi, as he's promised that his descendants would forever hold the priesthood on earth after there was a Melchizedek priesthood that he received it from. So basically, in a, in a, I guess what I'm trying to say is Levi actually stepped into the Melchizedekian priesthood on the earth because that was passed down from Adam who learned it from the angels while he was in the garden, which is called the kingdom of heaven. So the different qualifier that Hebrews 7 is trying to explain is just that the earthly priesthood that was given to Levi and his descendants is just for men that are upon the earth through the descendancy, the lineage of Levi. But the priesthood always was the Melchizedekian priesthood. It's the priesthood of righteousness, uh, rulers of righteousness, which is Malki is a word for king and, and uh, the Hebrew, and then uh, Zedek, Zedek is a word for righteousness. So this is why priest is, you know, a ruler, and he's supposed to have the right behavior um, so that he can mediate between the, the people that have the bad behavior and the father. So this is why Yeshua steps into that genealogy, that priesthood, excuse me, that order of priesthood, and not the one through Levi. So it's just pretty much understanding the, the caveat of Levi is what trips people up on the Melchizedekian thing. But yeah, basically all the angels are in like their own Mikhail, it's in the order of Melchizedek, which is the order of rulers who do the right behavior. That's all it means. So hope that's a good answer for you, brother. All right, guys, this, this will be it for the night. I really appreciate everyone being here. Hit the likes, the thumbs up button. Share this video if it blessed you. Uh, if you love what we're doing, go, go find us on Patreon. Uh, the link's in the description below. We really appreciate you. And we hope to see you here tomorrow night here in KingdomCast.